Jeff Slauson here from 19 News Now at the 19 News Digital Desk. We are going to be bringing you to the sentencing in the I-76 road rage, road rage incident case. You may remember this, Dakari Kennard uh, was accused and arrested of killing a man in a road rage, in rage incident in 2023. Now, he was ultimately found guilty on multiple charges, but not murder. Uh, it was voluntary manslaughter, felonious assault, discharge of a firearm on or near a prohibited vehicle, uh, premises, excuse me, and improperly handling a firearm in a motor vehicle. He's found non-guilty of murder. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with this story, I want to play for you a couple of the pieces that we've done here at 19 News. Before I do, I want to just show you what the new, the courtroom looks like as of right now, and that is the family of George Jensen, 40 years old. He was shot and killed May 17th, 2023. This was on I-76 in Norton. What we saw from the roads was honestly horrifying. His car was driving in the left-hand lane. Uh, the car driven by Dakari Kennard was being operated in the right-hand lane. You saw some muzzle flashes, and then you ultimately saw that car, again with George Jensen in it, careening toward the median and slamming into it. Now we hear all rise, which means that the judge Here is about to enter. Thank you. For those that have not tuned in to any of our sentencings prior to this, uh, they will sometimes allow for victim impact statements. So they will allow for the families to talk to either encourage or discourage a certain decision by the judge. Due to the nature of this and due to the multiple counts and multiple felony accounts, accounts on this, uh, Dakar Kennard could go away for a very long time. But ultimately, it comes down to, as you see, Kennard walking in, um, smiling, which uh, is unfortunate when a person died and that is the result of, of uh, the reason why he's there. But that is Dakari Kennard walking into court, awaiting the sentencing following the shooting and killing of George Jensen in 2023. As he sits down. All right, so we will bring you live there now. Again, you will hear most likely victim impact statements and then ultimately that sentencing. Going to take a little bit to get there, but regardless of the information we have and what we're going to see, heartbreaking for many. And so before we start with the sentencing, are there any, is there anyone, and I'm directing this to the state, that would like to address the court at this time? Yes, sir. Ms. Pank, do you swear or affirm that the statements you're about to give are true and correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. And what is your relationship to the deceased? I'm an extended family member. Thank you. And what would you like for me to know? Um, can I begin? Yes. Okay, thank you. Wednesday, May 17, 2023, was unlike any day I've ever known in my lifetime. A true nightmare to learn of a loved one's tragic, unbelievable, untimely, unnecessary, and senseless death by angry gunfire. Gio was a sweet, caring, intelligent, talented child and an adult, gentle man. And he has thought about daily. His wife, immediate and extended family, friends and co-workers were certainly thrust into an unwanted and unfair new normal. The immense pain and void felt by Gio's death is huge. I especially miss him in our large family holiday gatherings where he always enjoyed a hearty meal, his wonderful sangria skillfully crafted with his lovely wife Allison, along with laughs and jokes with the family. Gio had a shy, silly side of his personality which was very endearing. The memories will always remain with us. Dakari Kennard made the unfortunate, terrible decision to fire multiple gunshots and take another human being's life, leave the scene, continue to make poor decisions in Columbus, and then decide to lie about it. Your fear and rage manifested itself into a horrific, painful reality that the survivors are forced to live with. 
you seriously need to truly think long and hard about your actions and reactions and the everlasting triple effects they continue to have on so many others' lives. This intolerable behavior is difficult to fathom and has more than likely also affected your family in a very negative way. And finally, may Gio rest in peace and may God continue to help in our comprehension of this truly life-altering event in order to bring further healing, solace, and comfort to the grieving. And thank you for listening. Your Honor, before uh, the family started to speak, I did want to let everyone know that we are referring to George Jensen as Geo. That's how the family referred to him. And ma'am, do you swear from the statement you're about to give her true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am, I do. And can you please state your name, spelling your first and last name for the record? Nancy Keenan, N-A-N-C-Y-K-E-E-N-A-N. Thank you. And how are you related to the deceased? I'm a close personal friend. Thank you. And what would you like for me to know? Your Honor, George A. Jensen II, Gia, was my friend. A friend who I have known for 25 years. A friend that was the best man at my wedding. A friend that became the uncle to my three children. A friend that has been ripped from not only my life, but the lives of so many others. His wife, parents, brother, sister, and many, many friends. Gio was taken from us wrongly and way too soon. He played such a strong role in my life and my family's. He was the voice of reason to many people. He had a way with words that could only make you think a little bit harder about making a decision. That voice is now silenced forever. Gio and his wife had made many plans with my children to go to various music concerts last summer and the summers to come to help broaden their horizons and to show them things that only an uncle, Uncle Gio, was cool enough to do. He promised to teach my children how to drive a stick shift car, how to do many other things, Gio was an incredible advocate for them. Someone that they trusted would be in their corner, no matter what. Now he cannot do that. He's been robbed from all of us. He cannot, only, he cannot see my children's successes that they achieve, or see them graduate, or the partners that they end up with, and how they grow into adults. He cannot be there for the birth of their future kids. My kids now, will grow up never fully appreciating firsthand the kind of man that Gio was. This entire situation is a senseless tragedy, a tragedy that could have been prevented with only a little bit of patience, a little bit of kindness, and some self-control. So many actions that this killer could have taken, but he chose violence. My children will never forget Uncle Gio and that he was senselessly taken from us at such an impressionable time in their lives. My children, now, sadly, know firsthand how horrible one rash and irresponsible choice can literally change a life forever. A line must be drawn, an example must be made. Your Honor, I respectfully request that you impose the maximum sentence allowable under these crimes committed. Thank you for allowing me to address the court. Thank you. Sir, do you swear from the, the statement you're about to give or turn credit to the best of your knowledge? I do, Your Honor. Can you please state your name, spelling your first and last name? Um, your Honor, my name is Scott Keenan, S-C-O-T-T-K-E-E-N-A-N. And um, are you the spouse of the person that just spoke? Uh, no, that's my ex. Okay. What would you like for me to know? Great. Your Honor, my name is Scott Keenan. George Jensen was my best friend, a man I loved as my own brother for over 31 years. I stand before you today as a broken man, tasked with the impossible duty of conveying the profound impact of the loss of George Jensen. George Jensen, Gio. On May 17, 2023, my world was shattered into irreparable fragments when Gio's life was extinguished, extinguished by the senseless, cowardly, hateful actions of the convicted. I'll never forget the call from his wife, playfully asking me to send her husband home from work. 
the shock and fear in her voice when I told her he had left two hours before. The broken promise I made. And when I told her I'd find him and fix it. I'll never forget the anguish of his loss, screaming alone, begging to wake up from the worst nightmare imaginable. The anguish of knowing that I drove by the scene minutes after the convict's hateful and recklessly violent acts. As a former law enforcement officer myself, I focused on safely driving the road ahead and refused to rubberneck our very first responders and good Samaritans. I did not pull over, as there were many people assisting what I believed to be an ordinary accident. I have second-guessed that decision thousands of times, working out the math of travel and departure times, tracking down those same good Samaritans, and coming to a conclusion that I might have been able to save him if I had rubbed that just a little. Dr. Schott's testimony broke me anew. I was warned. I thought I was ready. I was not. I was not prepared to see my best friend's individual organs on the screen, to see his body laid bare. The convict did this to me, to us. The only solace I have now is the medical certainty that there was no time to save him, that he was mortally wounded and gone before I passed by, that my previous training in law enforcement likely spared me a moment so scarring that I would never be able to overcome it. That's the new anguish for me. To play a game and lose is one thing. To find out you never had a chance and the game was rigged is another else entirely. And during this trial was something I felt I had to do out of duty to my brother, to his parents and siblings and family. I would go and ensure they were okay. I would go and stare down the man I hate more than anyone or anything else in this world. I hate you, Dakari Kennard. From the bottom of my soul, I hate you. Jesus may forgive you. I will never. That's the last time I'm going to use your name. You get a number now. Someone will tell you when and what you can eat when you can pee, when you can sleep. You will be in a cage, like the animal you are. Gio's presence in my life helped form a path for both of us. His absence has left a void that can never be filled. Every day since his passing has been a struggle. So many things I have to learn to do alone. I still absently mindedly grab my phone in an effort to call him. I still expect to see him walk through the door. The best dreams I can have now are the ones where he shows up and explains where he's been. I cry in the shower when I wake up and it's not real. The memories we shared are now bittersweet reminders of once what was and what will never be again. From our childhood adventures to our professional work together, she here was my constant companion, my confidant, and my sounding board. He believed in me when I doubted in myself and lifted me up when I stumbled. His unwavering support and loyalty sustained me through the darkest moments of my life. I'd like to think he'd say the same about me if the roles were reversed. Gia was supposed to get my eulogy 40 years from now, plus, hopefully. Not the other way around in 2023. Gio's murder has not only robbed me of my companionship with him, but has also shattered my sense of security and trust in the world. It has cast a deep, dark shadow over my perception of society at large. It could have just as easily been me. We worked at the same place, drove the same route on the same road at the same times. The other six bullets that didn't hit my friend, they could have just as easily hit anyone else. How about a little girl? riding with her mother in a nearby car. The convict had to know these dangers and he didn't care. Someone wouldn't let the convict pass them in his little Camaro. And for that, he had to die. He chased my friend Gio down and killed him in a rage. 
like an animal. I have driven the crime scene hundreds and hundreds of times. From where the 911 caller and testimony in the trial identified the altercation starting around Alexa exit 11 to the spot where Geo died, 26 feet short of mile, mile marker 14, takes no more than two minutes and 45 seconds at highway speed. The convict killed a man less than three minutes after encountering, encountering him the very first time and without ever speaking a word. Then he cowardly fled justice and repeatedly lied and evaded responsibility. I'm haunted by the knowledge that Gio's life was violently and painfully cut short by the callous actions of the convict, a fact that fills me with indescribable rage and despair. The thought of Gio's vibrant spirit being snuffed out by such an evil creature is, is a wound that will never fully heal. Moreover, Gio's death and the prevalence of gun violence in our communities is a grim reality check that we can all afford to, to no longer ignore. As I grapple with the aftermath of Gio's murder, I am filled with the sense of urgency to advocate for change and to ensure that his death was not in vain. Your Honor, I implore you to consider the full extent of the devastation caused by the convict's actions. The loss of Gio Jensen has left an indelible mark on my life and the lives of all who knew and loved him. While no amount of punishment can ever undo the harm that has been done to us, I urge you to resolutely administer justice and to send a clear message to our community that such senseless acts of violence will not be tolerated. Gio was killed in a drive-by shooting on a crowded highway. It is nothing short of a miracle that no one else was hurt or killed in the convict's reckless acts of violence. The fact that innocent lives were endangered only compounds the gravity of the crime and underscores the need for your swift and decisive action to keep our community safe. Your Honor, I respectfully request that you impose the maximum sentences allowable under the law for the crimes committed by the convicted. By doing so, you will not only ensure that justice is served for Geo Jensen and his loved ones, but also send a powerful message that such heinous acts of uncontrolled violence will be met with the full force of the law. Thank you very much for allowing me to address the court. Do you swear or affirm that the statement you're about to give or turn correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Can you please state your name, spelling, first and last name for the record? Katie Bright Jensen, K A T Y B R I G H G J E N S E M. Good afternoon, Your Honor. First and foremost, I extend my gratitude to you for allowing me the chance to address the court today. I hope my impact statement offers a clear depiction of the profound impact this traumatic experience has had on both myself and the entire family. I stand before you today with my heart heavy with grief to speak on behalf of my family and the tra tragic loss we have endured due to the senseless act of violence that claimed the life of my brother-in-law, Gio Jensen, at the hands of Mr. Kennard. The events of May 17, 2023 have left a permanent mark on our lives forever altering the fabric of our existence and leaving an irreplaceable void in our hearts. Gio wasn't solely a brother-in-law. He was also a son, grandson, husband, brother, friend, cousin, and cherished uncle to his best friend Scott's children. He loved animals, often contributing to nearby rescues and nonprofits, had a passion for ska music, solely wore Chuck Taylors, and took pride in patronizing local, small, and unique businesses. Gio stood as a symbol of strength and empathy and was deeply ingrained in our family's fabric. His absence is felt in our homes and our hearts, an enduring reminder of the love, generosity, and unmatched wit we will forever miss. A particular memory from October 22, when I married Gio's brother, Tony, stands out. After Tony and I made our way back down the aisle, Gio hugged me and said, welcome to the family, Katie, and good luck with that. Filling the moment with love and a layer of trademark sarcasm, familiar to all who knew him. I was thrilled to officially be a part of the Jensen family, gaining not only a loving husband and best friend, but also an older brother, two sisters, bonus parents, and the most incredible extended family imaginable. I didn't realize it at the time, 
but those words would become a bittersweet memory, a reminder of the brother-in-law I cherished, but wasn't given nearly enough time to get to know. During the two and a half years I was able to share with Gio, he showed me nothing but generosity and kindness. When my car needed new brakes, Gio volunteered to assist my husband with the project and worked late into the night in our small turn garage. When Tony and I wanted to upgrade our wireless routers, Gio ensured we had the best technology available and sold. When I confided in Gio about purchasing concert tickets for Tony's birthday, he aided in crafting a meaningful, meaningful surprise for his brother. Gio's acts of kindness weren't just actions. They embodied his compassionate soul, leaving an everlasting mark on all who knew him. The most challenging part of this tragedy for me, however, is not the pain and grief I have felt, but having to watch my husband, the strongest man I have ever met in my life, an army combat medic, a civilian paramedic and firefighter, grapple with the indescribable pain of losing his oldest and only brother in such a violent way. Watching my real life hero collapse during severe panic attacks, nearly prompting an EMS call, has been deeply unsettling. There is nothing worse than watching the people you love suffer and knowing there is nothing you can do to make it better. I have never felt so helpless in my entire life. Consoling my husband after he started awake by night terrors and navigating potential emotional triggers throughout the day has overwhelmed me with anxiety. Despite my husband starting grief counseling last year and making significant strides in processing this trauma, it hasn't completely relieved the ongoing vigilance I maintain to prevent anything from triggering, triggering his diagnosed PTSD. I've also witnessed the intense suffering of my in-laws. The anguished cries of my mother-in-law and sister-in-law still echoes in my ears from the moment the Norton Police Department confirmed Gio's passing. The sound of my mother-in-law's weeping at the funeral home when we made arrangements, pleading with the funeral home director to see her son one last time, remains engraved in my memory. I can still vividly recall the pain and confusion in Gio's grandmother Grace's eyes upon receiving the news. At 96 years old and in hospice care, we had to tell Grace the devastating news that her beloved grandson had been killed. Every time our family gathers for holidays, I witness my father-in-law's tears. The tears of a man who have had to live every parent's worst nightmare, burying their child. Nothing in life prepares you for a tragedy like this. Our family is forever changed. I am forever changed. Yet it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the overwhelming love and support from our families, friends, employers, and the local community. It has served as a guiding light, showcasing the enduring beauty and kindness that prevail in a world that often can feel dark, violent, and daunting. We stand before you today able to speak our truths because of the unwavering support and community and encouragement of those in our lives. Your Honor, as you consider the sentencing of Mr. Kennard, I implore you to recognize the gravity of his actions and the devastating impact they have had on our family. While no amount of punishment can ever undo the harm he has caused, it is my sincerest hope that you will utilize your discretion, experience, and wisdom to ensure justice is served. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to our exceptional prosecution team, all of the witnesses and key individuals involved in resolving this case who came forward with information to assist our family in seeking justice. I would also like to thank the jury members, the Norton Police Department, the Good Samaritans and first responders who tried to save Gio's life on the scene, and Judge Michael for your dedication and diligence in ensuring that justice is achieved. May Gio's memory remind us of life's preciousness and the significance of cherishing every moment spent with your loved ones. Thank you. I will also be reading um, for my husband, Tony. Your Honor, my name is Anthony Jensen, and I am the brother of George Jensen. On the evening of May 17, 2023, I received a text message while at work from my sister-in-law, Allison, asking if I had heard, Gio, heard from Gio recently. He had not made it in home on time, and she was worried as she could not get in contact with him. I stated that I had last texted him before he left work. I immediately felt as if something was wrong. I texted my wife, Katie, who found a local news report on Facebook about a shooting on a highway. When she told me that it was involving a blue Mazda, my heart dropped. I ran out of Akron Children's Hospital where I work as a paramedic without telling anyone. I reached my car and drove to Gio and Allison's house while on the phone with Gio's best friend and coworker, Scott. I remember telling Allison I did not know what had happened or the severity of the situation. 
I spent four years as an active duty combat medic in the United States Army. Since then, I have been an EMT, firefighter, and paramedic in both pre-hospital and hospital settings. With over a decade of experience, I knew Gio was no longer with us. I called my sister and parents and told them to meet me and Gio, or meet me at Gio and Allison's, and that there had been an incident involving Gio on the highway. Scott had talked to the Ohio State Highway Patrol, who had told him an officer would meet us at Gio and Allison's house, where we all gathered and waited. When my mom asked me if it was a bad sign that we had to wait for hours for anyone to talk to us, it was heartbreaking, but I knew I had to tell her the truth. When the two detectives from the Norton Police Department arrived, they delivered the news that Gio was dead, shot multiple times in a road rage incident involving an unknown person who fled the scene. After they left, I called all of our family members that I could reach to deliver the news, knowing that my parents were in no shape to do it themselves. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. My wife and I ended up at our cousin's that night, trying to find some comfort in loved one's company. When we finally made it home that night, I broke down like I never have in my life. At some point, I fell asleep for a few hours. I have never felt pain like I did waking up that morning, realizing all over again what had transpired the night before. The following two weeks felt as if they flew by and took an eternity at the same time. Meeting with the funeral home, the calling hours, the funeral, and the wake. I missed two weeks of work, including 48 hours of overtime. Between that and my wife's missed work, it was an understatement to say the financial impact that it had on our lives. It was tremendous, a hole that we are still trying to dig out of today. Watching my parents, sister, family members, and friends attempt to process the vile and malicious nature in which Gio was ripped away from us has been a difficult as processing myself. The past eight months of grief therapy has been a tremendous help. While I will never forgive or forget what has happened, I am able to process, understand, and begin to try to move forward. Gio's murder has triggered PTSD-related issues that I haven't experienced in over five years. I have nightmares where I am thrust into trauma-related events, past patients I've treated, mass casualty events, etc. They repeat. I wake up from these covered in sweat with a rapid heart rate and breathing heavily. Sometimes I swear I hear gunshots or explosions that wake me up. I know that they aren't real, but they feel very authentic in the moment. I can't count the amount of sleepless nights I've had since May 17, 2023. I will never be able to find the words to accurately describe how much this loss has affected me. Gio was my older brother by five years. His influence on my life was invaluable. I would literally not be the person I am today without him. A wealth of knowledge and know-how, a person I could lean on when I did not have or did not know how to find an answer, has been ripped away from me. My experience and time in the Army has benefited and uplifted my life more than any other experience has, something I would have never considered without Gio's influence. My love of all things, mechanical and technological, comes from Gio. Albeit I will never reach the level of understanding that he did. If I ever had a computer problem, Gio could fix it. A car issue, Gio could fix it. A friend in need of a car repair on Christmas Eve, Gio fixed it. He gave me a place to live for a year when I finished paramedic school and saved up to buy my home. He was a caring, giving person who in my 35 years of knowing him never harmed another living being. He never carried a weapon. He was a politically conscious person who despised violence and the rhetoric that seems all too common in our country today. He was a guiding light in my formative years that helped me become who I am today. I will forever miss him and never forget or forgive what has happened to him. I hope you will take into account all of the grief, suffering, and financial hardships that we as a family have had to continue to go through. I believe that the defendant is a danger to others and that he has not told the truth since he pulled the trigger and emptied his weapon into my brother's car. I do not buy this remorse. I do not believe a single word that he says. He is completely lacking in judgment and moral character. Please do not let this man have the opportunity to harm anyone else. I can only hope that this will somehow bring closure to our family. Thank you.
Um, my name is Craig. Do you swear from that the statements you're about to give are turned correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am. Please state your name, spelled your first and last name for the record. My name is Amy Boland, A-I-M-E-E, -E, B as in boy, O-L-A-N-D. And I am reading on behalf of Emma Jensen, Gio's sister. I honestly don't know where to start with writing this letter. Quite honestly, I'm still grappling at the fact that my big brother was murdered nearly a year ago. That's a phone call no one deserves to receive. I know Gio wasn't perfect, none of us are. We have our faults and mess up frequently. That is no excuse to take out your gun and shoot my brother. Eight shots. You claim that you were scared when an irrational person who was scared by another driver back off and get away from them. You went full bore into this altercation, shooting your gun eight times into my brother's car. Doesn't that seem a bit excessive? We had to sit and listen to your testimony where you painted yourself as a quote unquote full-time dad. I can't even begin to count how many times you said you were scared or lied in your police interview because you quote unquote didn't know what to do. We had to listen to this tale you were spinning for over an hour. Guess what? My brother isn't here to defend himself because you killed him. Gio leaves behind a tight-knit family who are still trying to make sense of this terrible situation. He leaves behind a mom and dad, brother and sister. He leaves behind his best friend, Scott, who has been best friends for nearly in their entire lives. He leaves be behind his beautiful and strong wife, Allison, whose life has been affected the most throughout this terrible year. Gio and Allison were soulmates, a perfect match. He leaves behind his daughter, he leaves behind his dog, Hazel, and a plethora of cats. He leaves behind a giant hole in family gatherings. I still find myself looking for him at holidays, birthdays, and random trips to the brewery. Our hearts are broken, and I'm not sure they're ever going to be mended. Because you made the choice to pull your gun out, fire eight shots, and kill my brother. Gio was quiet but observant. Oftentimes at family get-togethers, you could find Gio and Allison off in a quiet corner, giggling and drinking their craft beer. Gio was probably the smartest person I knew. Since he was little, he always wanted to take things like computers apart and put them back together. He was a tech wizard, and he was always the first to call me, first to call when we had something that wasn't working properly. Gio would come over and fix the problem in no time. Gio was special. They don't make him like that anymore. Growing up, Gio was the oldest, then Tony, then me. We got into all the things that siblings do, fighting, arguing, chasing, threatening. My mom had her hands full with us. Back in 2016, when the Indians were one game away from winning the World Series, Gio showed up at the house and said, let's go. So we drove to Cleveland and stood outside the stadium until the bitter, devastating end. I will always hold that memory close to my heart. I could go on and on and on and tell you about the million more stories similar to these. And at the end of the day, Gio was more than just some guy driving on the highway. He can't speak for himself, so we are speaking for him. However many years you will get will never be enough. You get to live, you get to breathe. You get to see your kids and your family. You robbed Gio's life from him and everyone who loves him. And maybe next time you'll think twice before illegally firing your gun eight times. Thank you. Sir, do you swear from that the statements you're about to give are turned correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Can you please state your name, spell your first and last name? My name is Anastasios Georgiatis, A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-O-S-G-E-O-R-G-I-A-D-I-S. -S -E Thank you. I am uh, uh, 
Allison's brother-in-law and by extension Gio's brother-in-law and I'm reading the words of Victoria Key, Gio's mother-in-law. I was blessed to have two amazing son-in-laws. They are men who loved, cherished, and respected my daughters for the unique and strong women that they are. One of them was Gio Jensen. The other one is reading the statement for me, Stas Georgiatis. Thank you, Stas, for being a rock for our family. Sadly, I don't think I ever thank Gio for being the perfect partner for Allison, Gio's wife of 17 years. And now it's too late to thank him because he's gone. And we are left with a giant hole in our family. That late afternoon on May 17, 2023 was just a regular day you know, normal. But our daughter Allison became slightly concerned when Gio was about 30 minutes late, coming home from work, and that was not normal for him. He always came straight home for work, or at the very least called. Allison was waiting for him to get home because they had plans to go to Costco and then out to dinner. We became more concerned as time passed and no Gio. My husband, John, Allison's father, decided to go to uh, uh, Gio's work and retrace his route home. No results, no Gio. John drove to Allison and Gio's home in Akron. Calls were made to hospitals, police, friends. Waiting with Allison and her dad were Gio's parents and siblings, Emma, Tony, and Katie, and his employer friend, Scott. Finally, Allison received a call from the Norton police that they would be coming to Allison and Gio's home for about, excuse me, about four hours later, I received the call from my husband and heard the words, Gio has been shot and he is dead. I screamed, not Gio, not Gio. In that second, our world came crashing down. Gio was so loved by all of us. I was overcome with pain for my daughter and pain for George and Sue. It was just surreal. Someone killed George and Sue's son. Allison's beloved husband was gunned down and dead. How could this happen to a healthy, productive, giving, loving, gentle, 40-year-old man? Our Gio. As a 75-year-old great-grandparent, I have lost and grieved over many dear people in a lifetime. Folks that have suffered from short and long illnesses, accidents, or died simply of old age. And it's always very sad to lose a loved one. But those losses are part of life. We'll deal with those losses and we move on. But to have a loved one so senselessly and viciously shot and killed, murdered, is an unbearable kind of pain and a sadness that the Key family and the Jensen family will forever share. Allison and Gio were a team, exactly perfect for each other. My son-in-law's life was stolen. Allison lost her partner and best friend. In the blink of an eye, my daughter became a 37-year-old widow, having to plan a funeral, having to endure a murder trial, and having to evade publicity she never wanted. George and Sue are left grieving their firstborn child. Tony and Emma are without their big brother. And all this pain can be laid at the feet of Dakari Kennard, a hot-headed driver who traveled with an illegal loaded weapon sliding around on the floor of his car. Dakari Kennard had the opportunity to hit, tell his story in this very court, but we will never have the opportunity to hear Gio's story about that day in May when he was driving home for work like any normal day to meet Allison to go to Costco and go out to dinner. This is Kennard's day to be sentenced for his crime. Allison, the Jensen family, and the Key family have already been sentenced. 
we are sentenced to a life of grief and tears in a future without Geo. May his memory be eternal. Do you swear from that the statement you're about to give our term correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Could you please state your first and last name spelled both for the record? Uh, Allison T. Jensen, A-L-L-I-S-O-N-K-E-E-J-E-N-S-E-N. -E -E I'm Geo's widow. Um, and Dakari, I'm talking to you. I want this for you a conversation. I don't think that you're an animal. I don't think you're a creature. So I would appreciate you looking at me when I try to talk with you, OK? Um, she and I have been together almost half of my life. Um, we met when I was 19 and he was 22. Both of us lovers of music, art, and bad movies. He was constantly working on cars and computers. Um, his rational mathematical mind complimenting my chaotic free spirit. We were together nearly 17 years. And um, when we got our house in Akron, we had to make sure that the garage was big enough for all his car hobbies. So much car stuff you don't even understand. Um, our 14th wedding anniversary would have been on October 3rd, and we gathered with family that day. Um, we all held gratitude that gently eclipsed grief for a fleeting moment before the shadows of loss again darkened what should have been a celebration. One of those feelings that don't have a name. We had an unconventional marriage prioritizing pets instead of kids and hobbies instead of vacations. Food was Gio's love language, and he would spend hours or even days perfecting a recipe, getting to share with loved ones, whether it was the sangria that we made for weddings or something from the grill. He loved helping friends and family with car projects, electronics, anything food related. Um, if we saw someone in the parking lot with their head up, it, we, he would always stop. I didn't have to say anything. He just always wanted to help. Um, he was someone who actively tried to do better and who was working on himself. After a lifetime of battling anxiety and depression, like a lot of us do, he was getting help, and he was feeling really optimistic. He had a job that he finally loved, and he enjoyed a quiet life. And like all of us, he was imperfect, but he learned that he was worth loving. Part of me thought that if I had the right words, that it could help the defendant gain some empathy and have some clarity as to the depth of what you've done. But if you're a rational, ethical person, you wouldn't have kept a loaded gun underneath your passenger side. A full-time dad? I shouldn't have to beg for you to see that what you did was wrong. It's not up to me to make you a better person by cataloging all of my suffering. There's no reason for things to have ended the way that they did. Both of you acted impulsively. Both of you too proud to back down. Both blinded by fear and anger. You should both be here to defend yourselves. But he's not. I may not change you, but what may do so is time. And for that, I do ask for the judge to impose the longest sentence as possible. Because one day, you will go home to your family. You will walk through your door again. Hopefully, after a long time, after gaining some insight and humility, hopefully a changed person, less prone to impulsivity and reactivity. And I do not want you to rot in prison. I want you to grow. Meanwhile, I will spend the rest of my life waiting for Geo to not walk through a front door. The last time we spoke was over text on May 17th. The last message he's read of mine was at 2.35 p.m. And his last text to me was at 1.58. And it said, well, tomorrow. That tomorrow came. I woke up in my parents' house, still in shock. And he didn't come home until I was carrying him in a box smaller than a shoebox. Days later, a box that once held a life that I knew and a love that I once had. Dr. Jane Goddard once said that you cannot get through a single day without having, it, having an impact on the world around you. And what you do makes a difference. And you have to decide what kind of difference that you want to make. Gio's gone, but he's making a difference to this day and will continue to do so. Um, thousands of dollars have been donated into his name to local nonprofits. His impact is measured in the ways that we witness the Akron community lift up our families in the darkest times of our lives. 
Um, strangers offering kind words, stories, meals. Luckily, Akron is, um, Akron's love language is food, too. Uh, when we share something we love, we feel Geo's presence. When we're looking for a 10 millimeter sock in the garage, we feel his presence. When we remember, when we need to remember to take it easy and breathe, we also feel his presence. And his impact is felt by the connections he formed, creating a massive web of love and support that continues to bring people together to this day. The defendant's impact is felt on the world by leaving a crater of loss, by leaving a hole in my heart where love should be. But unlike my husband, you have the rest of your life to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Free Palestine. that you're about to give her to and to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. And your name, sir? George Jensen Sr. Uh, G-E-O-R-G-E J-E-N-S-E-N-S-R period. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I'd like to begin by saying that I found most of the actions that took place in this courtroom quite fascinating. I like most of the people involved the judge, the prosecutors, the victim's advocate, the law enforcement, especially from Norton Police Department, and your deputies. The jurors, but especially the witnesses that came forward on the scene and then later to give their independent testimony. Independent testimony. These are some of the best people you could ever meet. I'm truly humbled by all of the effort that was put into this prosecution by so many people. I like their use of the language and the precision exercised in the crafting of so many sentences. After the verdict, I went to work to understand what it meant. I found all of the related Ohio Revised Codes and got busy. I discovered many more of those precise, well-crafted sentences. An example, no person shall purposely cause the death of another. So, in review, 5-17-2023, our son, George Axel Jensen II, is murdered by firearm in a road rage incident on I-76 East by an unknown assailant who then fled the scene. 5-18-2023, along with my wife and my brothers, Gary and Grant, we visited our mother, Grace, at Bath Creek Nursing Home to inform her of Gio's death. This news was especially difficult to convey when we let her know he had been shot to death on the highway. This meant she has now lost two Georges, as my father, George Albert Jensen, died in 1959. I was four years old. 525-2023, calling hours at Redmond Funeral Home, Stowe, Ohio. 526-2023, celebration of life for Geo Jensen, Bethany United Church of Christ, Cobb Falls, Ohio. 725-2023, <clears throat> Grace Ellen Jensen, 96 years old, passed away in her living room with my brother Grant at her side, Cobb Falls, Ohio. 9-16-2023, celebration of life of Grace Jensen, again, Bethany United Church of Christ, Cobb Falls, Ohio. 2-5-2024, our daughter Emma is admitted to Akron General Medical Center with a life-threatening medical emergency. This is an ongoing crisis, but she was present 
for every minute of this prosecution. 3-26-2024, Tuesday, President and Judge Catherine Michaels courtroom to listen to the direct testimony from the defendant. I will leave it to my reader to determine the emotional damage that may have been inflicted on our family as well as Allison and her family by the above review. So Gio drove much as he had multiple jobs as a technician that then he had to travel daily. This is where he developed his low tolerance for aggressive drivers. We don't blame him for his driving habits although we tried to help him get over it. I do believe he was defending himself that day, not the other way around as attested by the defendant in his direct testimony. The sentences that were crafted by the defense and their defendant were anything but precise as the prosecution so eloquently categorized them as nothing more than quote, self-serving statements that tried to paint a picture of our son Gio as some maniac driver out to threaten the life of some scared guy in a black Camaro. These self-serving statements contradicted direct independent testimony of multiple witnesses. I think we all know what that technique is called. Later on Tuesday, during closing arguments from the, from the defense, we heard a rather snarky question posed to the jury after a rather pitiful diatribe leveled against Gio. She wanted to know, what kind of person does that? Referring to an alleged action by the victim, our son Gio. So in the 15 days since the verdict, I finally boiled it all down. Those six words really galled me. In the words of the defendant in his direct, it pissed me off. Rhonda, indeed, I have an answer for you, dear Rhonda. He is a dead person. He is dead. He is a dead person because your defendant killed him. So I ended up liking the question. So I decided I could use it, I could ask it. What kind of person does that? As a full-time father, gets up at noon, travels to a birthday party for his nephew without children, spends two hours in a rather suspect part of Mansfield buying a clarinet for his daughter but didn't bring her along, drives a sporty black Camaro but couldn't get away from a blue Mazda in a road rage incident as he never tries to end the confrontation by slowing and getting away. Drives onto the right shoulder of the interstate to pass an innocent driver in the slow lane, then cuts left in a surprise move to get alongside another driver then puts five rounds into the passenger door with his left hand. Then slows to continue firing. Three more rounds into the rear of the car, it then speeds away. What kind of person does that? <clears throat> After initially denying all involvement, and when finding out there was a mountain of evidence against him, he and his defense come up with a story on the last day of trial that was never heard by anyone previously. And then he admits in direct testimony that he lied and talked in circles, yet expects all of us to believe his version of the facts. What kind of person does that? You know, Rhonda, I have an answer for those questions. He's the kind of person who is both monumentally stupid and is going to spend many years in prison after effectively ruining his life and the lives of many others as well. 
So by the way, Rhonda, we have, we have those blunt instruments with us most of the time. They're called cell phones. Your Honor, I have complete trust that you will do the right thing in your sentencing. Having never heard Geo sigh, after studying the revised code, I know just how complicated this case is. And I look forward to hearing your decision. Again, I wish to thank Greg Peacock and Zach Newman for the excellent work they did, as well as Detectives Kevin Starling and Ryan Connell, Norton PD, who put all of the evidence together for them. Now I come to the witnesses. The thank you will never be enough for what all of you did. Thomas Schmidt, Stephen Swinehart, Donald Davis, and Doug Crocker are some of the finest people I know of. Thank you for doing the right thing, you guys. Finally, thank you, Megan Jewell, our victim's advocate, who really put everything together for the Jensen and Key family. Love you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. That is all, Your Honor. Um, I think before we get started, yep. uh, Mr. Kennard, is there anything that you wanted to say at this point? Um, I want to hear from him first. And then I can hear from his family. Judge, where do you want him to stand at? Um, where he is is just fine. And he doesn't have to stand. You can sit, sir. But if you want to direct your, your commentary to the family, um, please direct your, your body that way. Um, I would say that um, I'm very sorry. Um, you know, we have this to happen to the state of Ohio, to the city of Norfolk, to Summit County. Um, I'm very apologetic. I uh, just wish I could go back in time and take back my actions. And, uh, I'm very sorry. To my family, the victim family. Uh, I just wish everything was different, you know, that handle myself in, in a better man manner. Uh, I'm very apologetic and very remorseful. I'm sorry. Thank you. And are there family members of Mr. Kennard that would like to speak at this time? affecting our family also, and I'm, I'm so sorry. But I need to speak on my son's character because daily, I know I shouldn't be, but I watch news reports, all kinds of things about my son that speak, things that people going off of off this case, and that's not how my kid is. Since he was a small boy, football, since he couldn't Total football, that was his thing, all the way up to high school. He's, people often call him my favorite, maybe, I don't know, but I'm sorry. <clears throat> I feel like my son is kind hearted, a little deserved. He's a great big brother. Um, he will pick his brother up from school take him to the park, take him out to eat. He 
helped his brother for prom, tying his tie, told him how to tie the tie. He is a great dad. Great dad. He has two daughters that he loved dearly. He's good with his grandma. Anytime she calls, my mom is here. He will help her with anything she needs. Um, I'm a single mother, so it'll get hard sometimes. He would sneak money into my purse. I would miss him coming in, sitting in my room, having long chats. Um, I, I really don't even know what to say. It's, it's just heartening to be here in this situation. But I just want to put some clarity on my son's character. He is not who people see on this TV because of this case. I, I, I try not to watch it as much as I could, um, but I just, my heart breaks for him and it hit Mr. Jensen's family, and again, I apologize. But I want my son at home, I'm sorry. I know that might be a little selfish, but I ask that you be empathetic to our family and his children and try to do as much at least time as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peacock. Oh, there's some, someone else I would like to speak. Pam, do you, do you swear from the statement you're about to give or to correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Could you please state your first and last name for the record spelling both? My name is Susie Kinder. S-U-S-I-E-K-I-N-A-R-D. I'm Dakari's grandmother. And I think is a great person. I don't know what happened that day or what got into him. I just don't know, you know. But I'm going to say this. God makes no mistakes. Now you can put that in the perspective that you want to put it in, but he makes no mistakes. So everything that's done was meant to be done, and I am so sorry that this has happened. And I'm sorry for you guys is losing your loved ones. I know what it means to lose a loved one. I just lost one. <laughs> My love of 46 years died in 2020. And I'm telling you, if no one's been through it, you can't explain it. But Carr is a good father to his kids. He's quiet. He doesn't really bother anyone. And like I said, I don't know what happened, you know, and I'm sorry that it happened. And I ask that uh, you be light on this sentence and that he's learned something from this. And once you're gone, you can't come back. There's nothing we can do to bring, to bring him back. So I'm just sorry that it happened. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, do you swear from the statement you're about to give or to correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. Thank you. Could you please state your full name, spelling your first and last name for the record? Uh, my name is Toby Rushing, T O B Y, last name Rushing, R U S H I N G. Thank you. Um, I'm Dakari's father. That's my oldest son. And I want to apologize to the family. Sincerely apologize for 
which we wouldn't have to be here today or any prior day. You know, I, I know the pain y'all going through. And as a father, I'm going through the same with my son. Um, I'm just asking the court to be, you know, as lenient as possible. I know there's rules and regulations and things have to be done a certain way. I'm just asking the court to, you know, be lenient on my son and take into consideration that he is a good partner. This, 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 this isn't something he would, like, I don't know. I don't know how it started, but I just hope that the court, you know, would be leaning on my son and I'm asking the family to please forgive my son. That's it. Thank you. And this is a nightmare scenario for both families. There's no question about it. Sir, do you swear from the statements you're about to give are true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, yes, I do. Could you please state your first and last name spelling both for the record? Uh, first is Monty, M-O-N-T-Y, last name Hill, H-I-L-L. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And I am uh, this is a longtime father figure of um, the Kari Kanar. And, uh, you know, just like the, uh, I just like to give my condolences to the family. I mean, that's just a hard situation for both of us to be in. And, um, you know, all I can speak to is the character of Kari, you know, Growing up, because you know, I've, most of his life I've uh, um, been there making sure that he uh, grew to be the best man that he could be. You know, um, and, and it is, it's hard to sit here and uh, be on this side um, because, you know. I, Because I know the amount of uh, uh, time and uh, love that I put into the car, the time he put a kid. Based on 
just from the circumstances of the case, I, I, I understand that a lot of those options were eliminated and um, he was in an area that he was unfamiliar with. So, I mean, it, it, like I said, I, I, I can't speak on how we reacted. I just hate the outcome of what had happened, you know? Um, I just, I just ask that you, Your Honor, that you be lenient based on the facts of the case, you know, and um, I mean, I, I, like I said, I can attest to his character and just, just like, he was a good father. There were times where, um, you know, uh, we would, his daughter and my youngest son, you know, they went to the same daycare. So a lot of times I would see him, and I mean, I, that would be the, I mean, that was, since he was a, an adult, you know, that was a lot of times, that was, a lot of times that was the only way we interacted on most days because he, we had busy, adopted busy lives as adults. And, uh, you know, I miss, miss those interactions. You know, I just want to uh, let him know I love him. And I just ask for forgiveness. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I continue to, to pray for understanding. Your Honor, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peacock. Uh, Your Honor, uh, Greg Peacock, and on behalf of myself, Mr. Newman, uh, it's not on us at this time, so the state would um, state that um, the jury found that at that moment, the defendant demonstrated a cold indifference to human life, property, and the safety of others, and um, rejected the claim of self-defense. And so we're asking that the court um, impose a mandatory violent offender registry on the defendant, uh, the two to five years of post-release control, um, the two five-year gun specifications run consecutive to each other for 10 years, plus an additional 10 to 10 and a half years on for sentencing for Mr. Kennard for a total of 20 to 20 and 20 to 25 years. Thank you. Can we do it sidebar or do you want to go back? Okay. Does it have, do you want it to be on the record? The first thing I'm going to do, Mr. Kennard, is to, is there anything that you wanted to say on the record? Judge, no. I would just ask the court, I know that the request has been for a higher end of the sentencing range. I would ask the court to consider a sentence at the lower end of the range for the voluntary manslaughter. You do have discretion on that. The violent offender, he registered for, he signed it and presented it to the court judge. As it relates to the firearm specifications, um, we would suggest to the court that they be run concurrently and not consecutively. Um, and as it relates to a sentence, Judge, you've heard a lot here today. I know you have. Um, there have been a number of family members that have expressed how they feel about the two individuals that were involved in this. He sat through the trial. 
You know, Your Honor, that it was a tragic intersection of two individuals, and unfortunately one of them has passed away now. But we would ask the court to consider what we know about Mr. Kennard, what was going on that day, what had happened that day, Judge. And I would ask the court to consider on the voluntary manslaughter. He sentenced at the lower end of the guideline range. You do have a, a discretion on the voluntary manslaughter. It carries with it a potential of three to 11 years. We would ask the court to consider the sentence at the lower end. Thank you, Judge. The first thing I'm going to do is go over this notice of duties to enroll as a violent offender, uh, Mr. Kennard. Um, you've been convicted of or pled guilty to a qualifying violent offender offense as defined in Ohio Revised Code Section 2903.41. You are required, since you are sentenced to prison, to a prison term, you must enroll, or you will be sentenced to a prison term, you must enroll in the database personally with the sheriff of the county in which you reside 10 days after release from jail. If you are an out-of-state offender, you must enroll in a database personally with the sheriff of the county in which you reside or occupy a dwelling within 10 days of either residing in or occupying the dwelling in Ohio for more than three consecutive days or two, residing in or occupying a dwelling in Ohio for an aggregate period in a calendar year of 14 or more days. You are required to provide the sheriff certain information including your full name and any alias you use your residence address, your social security number, any driver's license number or commercial driver's license number or state identification card number issued to you, information regarding the offense of which you were convicted of uh, or pled guilty, and the name and address of any place where you are employed, the name and address of any school or institution of higher education you attend, the license plate number of each vehicle owned or operated by you or registered in your name, the vehicle identification number in each vehicle, and a description of each vehicle, a description of any scars, tattoos, or other distinguishing marks on your person. You are required to provide the sheriff fingerprints and palm prints. The sheriff will obtain a photograph of you at the time of enrollment. After the date of initial enrollment, you are required to re-enroll annually. You must update and or amend any of the information described above that is changed and provide any additional information requested at the county sheriff's office within 10 days of the anniversary of the calendar date on which you initially enrolled. If you change your residence address during the 10-year enroll enrollment period, you should provide written notice of that change to the sheriff with whom you most recently enrolled to the sheriff in the county in which you intend to reside within three business days of the change of address. <laughs> you are required to comply with all of the above described requirements for a period of 10 years unless your sentencing court determines otherwise. Since your expected resident address is located in Franklin County, you shall enroll in person no later than 10 days after release from prison with that county's sheriff's office located at 410 South High Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. Failure to enroll or failure to verify residence at specified times will result in criminal prosecution. If that occurs, it'll be a first degree felony. You understand? So you must follow these instructions. Um, is this your signature at the bottom of this form? Okay. Um, Or the charges, the two charges of voluntary manslaughter, a first degree felony, and the felonious assault, a second degree felony. Those charges merge, but the gun specifications, the firearm specification of five years times two do not merge. And those sentences must run consecutive and not concurrent with one another. And consecutive with the sentence that I'm about to give. So for the inferior offense, I've considered all the factors in this case. I know that you have no background of committing violent offenses. I know this. I don't know what happened that day or what caused 
what caused the loss. I know what caused the loss of Mr. Jensen. I don't know what led up to that. All of the people in this courtroom were affected by what happened that day. Every single one of the people in the back of the courtroom have been affected in a very bad way as a result of what happened because of the lack of judgment. That all being said, for the voluntary manslaughter charge, um, the sentence is five to seven and a half years in the penitentiary that must run and will run consecutive with the two firearm specifications for a total of 15 to 17 and a half years in the penitentiary. Your actions that day took you away from your family, but took Mr. Jensen away from his. And none of it makes any sense because it didn't have to happen. May Mr. Jensen's memory be a blessing to all of you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, um, after you're done with your prison sentence, you will be required to um, be on parole for a period of two to five years, depending on what the parole board decided. And if there are any violations of that parole, then the parole board could add 50% of your sentence back on top of your sentence. And if you were to commit a new felony offense while you're on parole, then the penalty could be as much as five years in prison. That would be consecutive, could run consecutive with whatever the new felony offense would be. Oh, uh, count four on the discharge of a firearm on or near prohibited premises. The sentence is 36 months in the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. It will run concurrent with for the total sentence of 15 to 17 and a half years in the penitentiary. Yeah, I believe there's a three-year firearm spec attached to that. I mentioned that this one concurrent. And that will run concurrent, the three-year gun specification. In that case, since it's inferior to the five-year, it will run concurrent. Is there, and I will suspend all fines and court costs. And I will sign Mr. Kennard, uh, public counsel. Is there anything else? Have I missed anything? Nothing on behalf of Mr. Kennard. All right, thank you. Are you going to appeal rights? Hmm? Is that appeal rights? Appeal rights? He. Okay. We're going to be assigning him a public counsel. Okay. And then this one. Yes. And there, Dakari Kennard walks off, sentenced to 15 to 17 and a half years in prison. Constantly you heard during the victim impact statements that mention that Dakari Kennard will eventually be able to walk back through his parents' door, and that is something that their son will not get the chance to do. Now you heard incredibly emotional testimony in this. Let's just listen back in real quick, see if there's anything else. Nope, doesn't seem to be so. Um, you heard incredibly emotional testimony in that. You saw Kennard, when he walked into court smiling, uh, that smile quickly faded as he had heard from both the victim's family and then his own family and even seeing him crying at some point after hearing his mother speak. So again, 15 to 17 and a half years for Dakari Kennard. We will have much more on this, of course, on 19 News. Our coverage starting or continuing right now, 3 to 6.30 over on CBS. 19 News, now streaming on Sam. You probably deserve it. Raise your hand here. No, stop. I want everyone to stop now. Stop. He's not right here. He wasn't right. He didn't see the escalator. Did we learn nothing? That one guy is Fine, so We're going to have you guys seeing here. We'll probably get Mr. Kennard standing out first. That's when I'll be here to answer any questions, okay? Is it ready to come out? Is it ready to come out? Yeah. That gentleman did not go. 